continuing through the Gospel of John. A beautiful gospel. And we're not going fast. We're taking our time through it because there is a lot to unpack in the gospel of John. John chapter 3 showed us why Jesus came, right? What his mission is. And John chapter 4 shows us the outcome or the effect of his mission. Mission. So let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 4. And our focus this morning will be in verses 16 to 26. And that can be found on pages 1056 and 1057 of the Pew Bible in front of you. And as you turn there, I want to say I've titled this message For His Glory. For His Glory. Everything in life, everything in creation has been done. For the glory of God. This is what Jesus is unpacking here with the woman at the well. Worship is for the glory of God. We live, move, and have our being in God for His glory. Nothing escapes the glorification of God. Let us keep that in mind as we read these verses and as we go throughout this chapter today. So let me invite you to rise once again, if you're able to, for the reading of the infallible, inerrant word of the, li- of the living God. Now, we know that Jesus is at the well with this Samaritan woman. And he's going through what salvation is, and he's using himself as the metaphor of water, the spring of living water. And she doesn't get it. And so Jesus says to her, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where People ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I I know that the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Doesn't that give you goosebumps? Praise be to God. Our Father and our God, we praise you for your word. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for for coming into this world, for taking on flesh, for living amongst the people who would crucify you, who wanted to have nothing to do with you because we love the darkness and not the light. But there you are nonetheless sharing this awesome gospel. And so we praise you for that. We praise you for going all the way to the cross for us. And we thank you that through your life, death, and resurrection, we can worship the Father. And so lead us now as we Go through these verses. May we glorify your gospel in them. For we pray these things in Christ's name, in your name, I say, Lord Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. You may be seated. As I said, for his glory. How often do you think about your life being for the glory of God? So often we get caught up. I mean, listen, me too, right? We get caught up in our day, in the things that we have to do. We think about getting ahead in life 
And when we've gotten ahead in life and we're getting close to retirement, we're thinking how to settle things down so that this way we can live out the rest of our lives in some sort of comfort. We have all the hassles of being a member of family, right? We have all the concerns of what's going on in the world around us. We have so many things that take us mentally away from the understanding that we live for His glory. Many people take up hobbies, right? A lot of people have hobbies. One of them being skiing. I was in the gym this morning, and I heard a couple of guys saying, hey, you going skiing this morning? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, they're crazy. I wouldn't go out there. It's really cold, right? But there they are talking about, right? And, and people are all excited about that. And like, oh, man, I love it. Right now we got the Winter Olympics going on. One guy said, he says, now I have something to do on Sunday, right? We fill our lives with so many things to keep us busy, to keep us happy, to keep us excited that we forget. Oh, how we forget that we are created for the glory of God. Everything that has been created has been created in order to glorify God. Everything. Look around. Anything you have ever seen, anything that you have ever experienced has all been allowed to happen for the glory of God. When you look at creation, if you've ever looked through a telescope, right, in the, at night and you've seen the stars and they say you can get a beautiful image of the stars being so high up in the mountains over here in Highland Lakes, you will realize that God has created this earth, this universe. There's no way that you cannot look at the stars and say that someone with eternal wisdom, with eternal might, has not created this. No, God has created And the earth itself bears witness to the glory of God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim His handiwork. As much as I do not like to freeze, even the cold weather declares the handiwork of God. We know that, right? Because what happens in the spring? Our grass looks richer, does it not? Right? It doesn't matter how bad your soil is. We got pretty bad soil up here, right? But, and I remember when I was trying to grow grass on the side of the church there, people told me, good luck. We don't believe in luck. We don't believe in you. You're going to be able to grow grass here either, right? But even in this soil, I was able to grow grass. And it's still there. Because God will be glorified by his handiwork. And so everything around us is there to glorify God. Therefore, all of creation must glorify God. Look at Psalm chapter 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then he says, praise the Lord, right? He's saying, let everyone who has breath praise the Lord. And then he calls them to, let's do it together, praise the Lord. That's our call in life, beloved, to praise the Lord in all that we do. And it doesn't always have to be verbal, right? It can be throughout our actions, non-verbal. Everything was created for God's glory. Everyone was created for God's glory. Even, even the unbeliever. The person who's atheist, the agnostic, was created for the glory of God. You might ask yourself, how? They don't glorify God in their life? They don't praise Him? They don't worship Him? In fact, a lot of them mock Him? They turn up their lip at Christ? They think that, that, that He's foolish, that the Bible is full of nonsense? How can the atheist or the agnostic who says, I think there might be something out there, but I really don't know, and so I'm kind of going to do nothing. That's an atheist. They don't believe in the God of the Bible. How can they glorify God? Well, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 10 to 11 tells us. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he's saying that this is what will happen to each and every person, whether you're a believer or not. He says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, Christ will be glorified. Each and every person that has passed away, whether they are a believer or not, knows that Jesus is Lord. They know that, and they have to confess that. But here's something else that happens with the unbeliever. As they are paying for their sins, every lie that they have ever said against God, everything they have failed to believe, God is vindicated in it. He is vindicated in them being illumined to the fact that he does exist. Let me give you an example of that. Have you ever told the truth about something and people called you a liar nonetheless? Right? You've been there. We've all been there. Right? We can lie from time to time, right? But there are times when we tell the truth and people don't believe us. And they might even say, you're a liar. And isn't it good when someone comes along your side and proves that you weren't lying? Doesn't that feel good? That you were proven to be telling the truth? Well, I got to believe that that's how God feels as he condemns the unbeliever. Now, we're not hoping for the condemnation of people. No, we want all people to come and believe in Christ. But even the unbeliever as they are condemned, glorify God because his word, his truth is vindicated in their suffering. And their suffering is not unrighteous suffering. Their suffering is righteous suffering. But we see Jesus here trying to share his gospel with the woman at the well. Why? In order to lead her to a saving knowledge of him, that one day she will be a Christian. Right? And Jesus, as he's sharing this gospel with her, is leading her not only into salvation, but to a life of worship that will glorify the Father, that will glorify him. The Apostle Paul understood this. He understood that we are saved for the glory of God, be it God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are gathered here today for the glorification through a time of worship of God the Father. The Apostle Paul writes this regarding the glorification of God in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 to 14. He says, in him, speaking of Christ, but notice he'll use him back and forth. And sometimes you can get lost when he's saying in him, through him, and whatnot. But when he's speaking here, he actually ends up speaking about the triune God. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Why? So that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. He goes on in verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Why? To the praise of his glory. In other words, once God saves you, he will keep you saved. Why? For the praise of his glory. When you mess up, and you will, and we do, God will restore you through repentance. Why? For the praise of his glory. And what is the Father seeking for us to do? Well, he's seeking us to call other people to come and believe on his Son that they too may be saved. Why? To the praise of his glory. That they will come in and be worshipers. Why? To the praise of his glory. Do you see how everything in life was created for the glory of God? This is what Jesus is trying to communicate to this woman. And we'll see there that she's, she's going to say, hey, but you know what? I've been worshiping. Worship on this mountain. But you guys say it's in Jerusalem. And she's saying, listen, your worship up until this point has been worthless. But now you've got an opportunity to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But you can't do that unless you believe in me first. And that's how it is, beloved. That's exactly how it is. If your worship is devoid of the lordship of Christ, God does not receive that. I've been in many worship services in different types of, of religions. And whenever it was an irreligious 
organization, I could sense it. I could sense that even though God is omnipresent, He's everywhere all the time, He is not blessing. He is not paying attention to that worship service. Why? Because it's more man-centered than it is God-centered. And when you understand that our lives were created and we were saved for the glorification of God, then you begin to live what's called theo centric. You begin to live with the thought of the theos, the God who, who reigns and rules over your life. You begin to live understanding that your mission, your call in life, your salvation was so that you will glorify him. And that works in every age of every single person. No matter where you are in life today, whether you be as young as Jada or as old as Rick, I just got, I love to throw you out there, brother. <laughs> God has called you to glorify him and everyone in between. God has called you to glorify him. And so if that's the case, then worship isn't just when we're here. No, worship is all the time. How you live. The Bible says, live for the glory of God. What you do for a living, do it for the glory of God. How you eat. Eat for the glory of God. Let everything that we do, let us do it for the glory of God. Amen? And so, just a brief recap, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What Jesus is doing here is that he's evangelizing. He's entering into evangelism, and he's doing it for the glorification of God. And so we see that evangelism is so important. It's an important part of what brought us to Christ, and it's an important part of what will bring other people to Christ as well. Evangelism, what it does is it seeks out worshipers for God. Think about that. It seeks out worshipers for God. Someone evangelized me, and here I am today worshiping God with you. Someone evangelized you, and here you are today worshiping God with me. Do you see how that works? And so let's look at the Gospel of John together. Here in verses 16 to 18, we see that serving the gospel faithfully requires exposing sin. Many people love to share the gospel. And I said this often, people love to say, Jesus loves you and has a great plan for your life. And then you start going into the plan. But if you have never addressed sin, you are not faithfully serving the gospel. And so this woman, Jesus is sharing the gospel with her, right? And, and she, what, what does she say to him in verse 13? She says, well, he says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman's like, yeah, I want that water. I want the water, but she doesn't get that Jesus is talking about himself, the eternal one who quenches our eternal uh, thirst. So in verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come and draw water again. Right? She's saying, I don't want to come back here. This is laborious. Can you please give me this spring water that I will not have to come back here again? And Jesus being the, faithfully, the faithful evangelist that he is, he's going to say, I need to go a little bit deeper with you. Right? And so he uses this as an opportunity to expose her sin because he's trying to tell her, you don't need physical water, you need spiritual water. So here's how he does. Here's how he draws that out. He tells her, well, you know what? Go call your husband and come here, right? Now he wants to expose her sin. He wants, and in exposing her sin, what he's doing is exposing her need. Now, some people may say, well, this seems kind of harsh because now you're, you're jumping into kind of, you're, you're putting your finger on that very sensitive nerve. You're jumping into the heart of this woman. You're going to expose her for the life that she's living. Do you think she's happy with what, the way she's living? And perhaps she's not, right? But some people would say, well, this is kind of mean, but it's not. It's not because we have got to show people what they need to be saved 
from. You can't know what you're saved for or to if you don't know what you're being saved from. I've used this analogy before. If I come up to you and say, here, take this medicine. The first thing you're going to say is, there's nothing wrong with me. Why do I need to take medicine? But if I tell you, hey, you're sick, you have this or this disease, and you need to take this medicine, then you will be more apt to listen to me and not just shrug, shrug me off. And so Jesus says to her, go and call your husband. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. I have no husband. And this is a good place to understand that this woman is lying by omission. Yeah, she's lying. She's omitting the fact that she's not married, that she's living with a man. Now, you might say, well, why would you tell anyone that, right? It's like you meet someone and say, hey, how you doing? My name is Mike. I'm a fornicator, you know, and, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm homeless, and, uh, hey, you want to be friends, you know? No, you see, you say to yourself, well, why? Well, she realized there's something different about this man, and Jesus is making that abundantly clear. And so she's lying by omission. And here's how we know she's lying by omission. Because you might say, how do you know she's lying? Well, we know that what Jesus says. But how do you know that she's lying? Well, here's where you have to look at the Greek, at the Greek language and the way it's written, right? So there's emphasis put on words, and they're put in the sentence based on their emphasis, right? And so when we look at the Greek here, we see that certain words are put in the emphatic position in order to draw emphasis to it. Let me give you an example of that, right? So in, in Romans, it says that we are, it, when it speaks about our salvation and assurance of salvation, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It reads good like that, but in the Greek it says, no condemnation, therefore, there is for anyone who is in Christ. Because it brings no condemnation to the beginning of the sentence in order to emphasize the fact that there is no condemnation. And so when this woman spoke, she said this to Jesus, I have no husband. The husband is the important word. She put it at the end of the sentence because she's trying to draw attention away from her lie. But when you read this in the Greek, it's actually written this way. A husband, it's the way it should read is, a husband I have not. That's how she should have said it. A husband I have not. Then it would have been a more true statement, right? Because she's putting the husband, the, the, the important part of the statement She's putting him at the front of the sentence. But no, she says at the end, she takes the most important part of the sentence and she throws it at the end. And she says, I have no husband. And so Jesus is going to put his finger on that nerve. And we can rightly say as well that Jesus, since he's fully God and fully man, is omniscient. And he knows this woman is going to lie. He knows what's in her heart. He obviously knows what's going on in her life. And so he's going to address it. So the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Jesus being that direct with you and exposing your sin? Right? Right? But that's what we need, beloved. We need to have our sin exposed in order to come to Christ. You know, there's many people that believe, that claim to believe in Jesus Christ, but yet they say they are not sinners. Well, their sin has not been exposed. They, and I asked them, then what have you repented of? Then why is he your Savior and not just your Lord? And so we see here that Jesus Jesus understands, he knows that you cannot share the gospel if you don't broach sin. Many churches hate to preach about sin. They feel that it turns people off. And yeah, it can turn us off. It can definitely turn us off. Because none of us like to hear about how sinful we are. But then there's good news after that. I got a call not too long ago. A person called here and asked, and, and I've gotten many calls like that and emails as well. They asked if they would be comfortable worshiping in our worship service because they're gay and they will come here with their partner. So this person, normally I send an email back or I call the people, sometimes they don't call me back. And so this person, I called them on the phone, right? And I, I got them back. 
And the person said to me, yes, um, we love your little church. We don't live far from there. And um, my partner and I would want to know if we would be welcome in your church if you guys celebrate the gay lifestyle. If we celebrate sin, is that what you're asking me? That we celebrate sin? This is not what I told her, but I'm thinking to myself, you want to know if you can come here and we will celebrate the fact that you're sinning before God. And claiming to believe, be a believer in Christ, but yet you have not confessed your sin or forsaken your sin. Is that what you want me to embrace? Is that what you want to hear? And I'm pretty sure that there's many churches out there that are telling people, yeah, come on in. We embrace everyone and every lifestyle. And it's an interesting thing because you go to a lot of those churches that hang the gay flag outside, and their pews are really empty. They have lost a lot of congregants, which tells us that they are embracing a group of people that are not embracing them. You would think that if they are going to totally go against Scripture, that they would have tons of people coming into the church. Well, just the opposite is happening. Why? Because if you don't tell people about their sin, then they will not want to come to Christ. They won't understand their need. And I told this lady, I, I really don't like that question because it's a trap. Here at our church, we preach biblical truth. We stand with the Word of God. We stand with, 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 with the biblical view of marriage and sexuality. And, let me, and, and even in that, let me tell you, you are 100% welcome to come and worship this church. But we can't celebrate any of that. What you will get here is you get peop he people here who will genuinely care for you. You'll hear the word of God preached faithfully every Sunday. You're going to hear a call to repentance. You're going to hear people singing and praising God, and you're welcome to come and join us. We do not restrict anyone for coming into our worship service. She said, thank you very much. She hung up, and I haven't seen her since. And I welcome her. Here. I welcome everyone here because everyone needs to hear the gospel of their salvation the same way Jesus did it. And so we know that in order to lead people to the gospel, we have got to expose sin. And as I was thinking about this, I, I thought to myself, the threshold to forgiveness and eternal life, the way to open that door is to understand sin. You can't open that door if you don't understand your sin. And Jesus is going to press her on it, which brings us to verses 19 to 24. Exposing sin opens the door to a greater understanding of the need of the gospel. Yes, exposing sin brings people to their knees. It may bring tears down their face, and that is a good thing. It's a good thing because then we understand how wretched we are and how much we need to be saved. And so what does the woman say to him? Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now she's beginning to get it. And in the Greek, it's really, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very humble statement. She's really beginning to bend her knee and understand this man is like no other man that I have ever met in my life. I perceive that you are a prophet. And this is not like how we throw the word prophet on I me. Mean, you go into inner cities, you know, and, and you drive around and you will see many people calling themselves prophets. You'll see it on their billboards of the churches. Come and see the prophet this and the prophet that. They did not throw these terms around, these titles around the way we do. And so when this woman is saying, I perceive that you are a prophet, it is clear that something is happening in her heart. But in spite of that, sin is going to fight it. It always fights it. And we'll see in her next words that she's trying to practice the art of changing the conversation. Why? Because sin is painful. But you can't allow the conversation to be changed. And so she says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she kind of looks to the mountain, Mount Gerizim. And she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. She's kind of saying, you're a prophet, so you should understand this. I have a theological question for you, right? Let's forget about my sin. Let's forget about my five husbands and the guy I'm with now, right? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. 
But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You know, and if Jesus was any other guy, he'd say, well, yeah, let's talk about that. But no, no, no. Jesus is not going to use that as an opportunity. And so we see that Jesus stays the course. He doesn't allow sin to be swept under the rug. In fact, now he's going to say, oh, you want to talk about worship? Well, let me tell you how you have failed to worship. And so he says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, that is Mount Gerizim, right, nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Think of that, where you worship the Father. And then he tells her this in verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And it seems like Jesus is just cutting her down, cutting her down. Because he went from her sin, he wanted to talk about her sin and her need for the living water, but she took it off into her theology, and he's going to tell her, guess what? Your theology isn't going to save you either. Your religiosity isn't going to save you either. And it, this kind of seems weird when he says, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Well, he's going to use the two mountains. He's using that as an example. So if you understand anything about Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, you'll understand that one mountain was the mountain of blessing, and the other mountain was the mountain of curse. Oh, a mountain of curse. Yes, Mount Gerizim was the mountain of blessing, where God, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, right, he tells Moses, he says, I want you to get certain tribes, get them up on Mount Gerizim, and say, you will be blessed by God if you follow me. You will be blessed in the city, you will be blessed, you know, your kneading bowl, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your land, everything will be blessed if you follow me. And then he says, now I want these other um, uh, priests from, this, from the rest of these tribes to get up on Mount Ebal, and I want you to um, command the people and say, if you fail to worship me, to love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, I will curse everything in your life. I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 12 and 13, we see God says to them, when you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. So he's talking about one set of the tribes, the 12 tribes, Simeon, Levi, Judah, um, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Let them get up on Mount Gerizim and bless the people. So if the people are listening to God, they can go and worship God at that mountain. Then he says, and these, he's referring to Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali, shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse. And so if you fail to worship God, you're going to um, receive the curse. And then you have to go back to that mountain to worship God, to offer up your offerings in order to be forgiven of your sins. But where were they worshiping? They, they said, well, we'll go to the Mount of Blessing. And they were worshiping at Mount Gerizim, which was the wrong mountain for them to be worshiping on. That's why Jesus said to her, you worship what you do not know. You're worshiping on the wrong mountain. You're worshiping in the wrong mindset. You're worshiping with religiosity, and that's not what God wants. And once you trust in me, you will understand exactly what God wants. And he says, we worship what we know. We're worshiping in Jerusalem. The worship has gone away from these mountains, and it's ended up in Jerusalem. For salvation is from the Jews. And Jesus is not making a high and mighty statement here, but he's letting her clearly know that the people who have despised you and the ones whom your tribe has despised are now the very ones through whom God will bring salvation. And he's kind of telling her, pay careful attention to me. Pay careful attention to me. For, for yes, I am a prophet and I am a Jew. And then he goes on in verse 23 and he says, but the hour is coming and is now here. Now imagine that. Imagine you're that woman at the well. Or imagine you're, that, you're a fly on the well and you're listening to this, you're watching this, and Jesus is telling you, but the hour is now here. In other words, what you have been worshiping wrong, now you will be able to get it right. And is now here when the true worshipers, and when he's saying that, he's saying whether it's Jew or Samaritan, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship. Him. Notice he doesn't say for the true Jew. 
will worship the Father in spirit and truth. No, he says the true worshipers. So he's drawing a greater group of people in. And he's kind of telling the Samaritan woman, that can be you as well. But the Father is seeking that you worship him in spirit and in truth. The Father's seeking you, he's telling her. He's giving her good news. The Father is seeking her. And there's something to this understanding of spirit and truth. And we're going to look at that. But he goes on to say, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. That's the first part we've got to understand. God is not a physical being. I know the Bible speaks about his arm and his eye, right? The hand of the Lord. But it's using anthropomorphic language. In other words, so that we can understand the person of God. But God is spirit, which means that God is everywhere at all times. After this, I will be heading to Pastor Jay's church. God is already there as well as being here. When I'm over there, God is still here. God is everywhere all the time. And what he's telling her is this. Worship will not be confined to a temple. No, because, and what she doesn't know is, when God's spirit comes to reside in you, he will be worshiped in you. If you have believed in Christ, the spirit of God is in you you. Therefore, if we didn't have this building, if we were gathering in a basement, we would still be worshiping God in spirit. Which also means to say that God doesn't need all of the religious paraphernalia to be worshiped. He doesn't need statues, nor does he want them, right? We find that out in Genesis, uh, all throughout, all throughout, I should say, um, uh, Exodus. We find that out there. He doesn't need the religious paraphernalia. He doesn't need a little baby Jesus up over here. He doesn't need Jesus hanging on the cross. No, Jesus is risen from the grave. He's no longer on the cross. We don't need the Virgin Mary. We don't need any of that stuff. And that's what it is. It's stuff that makes us feel good, that adds to our religiosity. But God is saying, I don't want it. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Worship him in spirit and truth. I preached on this once before, but I love when this comes up because it reorients our, undermine, our mind around how to worship God. Sadly, however, many people worship God with more spirit than truth. Some people feel that you've got to have a spirited worship. People have either got to be dancing around or everyone's got to have their hands up and tears coming down their face and falling on their knees. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that if it is authentic. But I'll tell you right now, there's many churches out there that are worshiping with all spirit and no truth. I've been to some of these churches where it's like a, a concert, right? And, and, and when you start getting down to the, to the, to the part where you got to hear a message, that message better be quick, and it better help me with my personal life. Otherwise, you know, I'm just going to come for the music. That's not what God is looking for. And then there's other churches, kind of like Pentecostal worship. It's not to say that the Word of God is devoid there, but I've been in those worship services as well. And I've told some of you some of this. I remember I've got one friend. He said he was in the church, and, and, the, and, and it was a Pentecostal church. And he said, you know, I just wasn't feeling the Spirit. I've been there for years. I wasn't feeling the Spirit. And then one day he says, you know, Mike, I just felt the Spirit. I was, I was sitting there, and everyone was singing and dancing, and I was holding the chair, and I just started banging the chair, banging the chair, banging the chair, banging the chair, banging the chair. I said, dude, that's not the Spirit of God. That's a demon. Because the Spirit of God is a God of order. God doesn't want me throwing furniture. He doesn't want me, oh, you got to believe in Jesus and chuck this, this, this pulpit aside. No. So that's nonsense. And then there's other churches where people claim to be slain in the spirit. And, you know, and that can really happen. These things, can, there are true worshipers that come out of some of these worship services. But sometimes these services, this is my point, and I'm not trying to put them down, but some of these worships are all spirit and no truth. And so we got to check that. We got to say to ourselves, am I going to church for just spirit 
Or am I going there for spirit and truth? Am I going there just because I like the music? Just because I like the hymns? Some people didn't come back here because we, didn't, we don't play four hymns now. Now we play two hymns and two contemporary songs. Some people didn't come back. That's the reason why you left? They told me, you know what? I loved your preaching. It was biblical. One guy used to love when I would quote theological things, but he didn't come back. Why? Because we played two contemporary songs. Really? That's your reason for leaving? That is nonsense. If I said something wrong, if I continually say something that is, that is irreverent, then yes, call me out on it. I should hear your calling out on that. But if it's just because you didn't like the music, what? Because then there's other people, there's the flip side of that, that people only stay in a church because of the music. A lot of people in New York City, if it's not, you know, drums and guitars and, you know, a nice solo. I remember we were in one church and there was this one brother that was sitting there and he'd said, yeah, and he fell on the floor. And everybody's like, woo, yeah. I was like, what? What happened? He was singing and he just threw himself on the floor. And people love that. And again, it's not to say that God is, is not working in some people's lives there, but we've got to check ourselves. Are we more spirit than truth? And then there's other churches that are more truth than spirit. Yeah. There's more truth than spirit. There's churches that are so doctrinally sound that they feel that you should never raise your hand in worship because now you're just trying to draw attention to yourself. They're the ministers that come in and, good morning, saints. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm like, what? You're putting me to sleep, man. Somebody give me some Benadryl, right? And so God, he wants us to be filled with spirit and truth. He doesn't want us to be the frozen chosen, right? We look at today, many people waking up with a frozen battery, right? What happens with a frozen battery? There is no spark. I experienced that one firsthand already with my truck that I brought up here from Florida. My truck was used to the warmth. It loved the warmth. And when I tried starting it up one cold morning, it said, ¿Qué pasó? What happened? That's what I said, too. I said, ¿Qué pasó? I went, kick, 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 kick. I called my buddy Andy. Andy, what do I do? He says, the cold weather killed it. <laughs> and there's some Christians that are like that. They're the frozen chosen. But God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Listen to what Jesus says about those who are the frozen chosen. Those are the ones I really want to focus in on. He says this in Matthew 15, he's, and he's chastising the Pharisees. He says, so for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did um, Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. And so we, we realize that, you know, God is calling us to truly worship him in spirit and in truth. And so what does that mean? Well, spirit and truth, when you think about it, spirit means our innermost being. God wants for you to search deep in your heart and to understand why you worship him, why you follow his son, why you come here on a cold eight degree Sunday morning to worship God. Why is it? Is it because you understand that he is altogether beautiful, altogether glorious, and wild horses couldn't hold you back? Why is it that you come to church? Why is it that you want to worship God? Why is it that you do devotionals every morning? I remember Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest of the commandments? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is what it means to worship God with spirit, to worship him from the depths of your heart. That if you're on vacation, you say, you know what? I'm finding a church to worship in because God never takes a vacation from me. Therefore, I dare never take a vacation from worshiping him means that you worship him from the depths of your heart. And then, of course, truth. Well, truth, that's an easy one, right? But it's such a hard one to deal with. Truth is according to God's word. According to God's word. According to who God is. According to his character. According to his name. The psalmist writes this, Psalm 103, verse 1. 
bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That is my heart, right? My soul, the intentions of my heart and all that is with me, within me, bless his holy name. Well, the only way you can bless the name of God is if you know the person of God. And this is what Jesus is telling this woman. He's telling her the Father is seeking people. And he's telling her that because the Father is seeking her. I want to ask you this morning, are you worshiping God? Not just now, but each and every day. Are you worshiping God in how you live in spirit and in truth? Are you worshiping him because you love him? Or are you worshiping him because of some other reason? I pray that it is because of your love for him. Verses 25 to 26 shows us this, that Jesus shows the woman and us that he is the loving, or I should say the long-awaited Savior who will lead us to the Father. Jesus is going to say, I am the one that you worship the Father through. So he says here, the woman says to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. And then John enters in a parenthetical statement. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And she's saying, you know, I'm waiting for that day. I'm waiting for that day. I'm looking forward to that day. When that day comes, I know that the Messiah will let us know how we must worship God. Imagine saying that to Jesus. What do you think he's going to say? The day is here. Here am I. And so Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And this is beautiful in this language, but it's not exactly how Jesus said it. It's actually more powerful in the Greek. In the Greek, the way Jesus said it is this. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I am. I am. He's referring back to when God first introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush. I who speak to you, I am. And we know that when Jesus said that, he's referring to God himself. And we know that because in John chapter 8, Jesus is going to say, before Abraham was, I am, and the Jews are going to pick up stones to stone him. So we know that he's referring to himself as Almighty God, as Yahweh. Before Abraham was, I am. And now to this woman, I who speak to you, I am. In Isaiah verse 43, chapter 43, verse 11, the Lord says this, I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Which is to say that the Savior is the Lord. The Savior is the one who has saved you for his glory, for his namesake. And so once again, we've got three key takeaways for these verses. And the first one is this. Jesus came to seek and save worshipers for God. Yes, when you look at your life as a believer in Christ, you can say to Jesus, mission accomplished, for I seek to worship the Father. And the second one is this, failing to address sin keeps us, and I would say also, and others from salvation and robs God of worship. Yes, when we fail to address sin in our lives, this is why we have a, a, a call to repentance during our worship, because we want to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And when we fail to, when we just tell people that Jesus loves you and has a great plan for your life, we're failing to deliver them the full measure of the gospel so that they can worship the Father. And this, in turn, is robbing the Father of his worship. And finally, therefore, take the gospel to heart. Take it to heart. Let it penetrate deep within your soul. Take the gospel to heart and share the gospel with others for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our Holy Father and most gracious God, we bless your name. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for how you have sought us out, how you have sought us in your Son, how you have saved us through faith in your son. And so we praise you this day, O oh God, and we pray that we would understand the magnitude of why we have been saved, just like the woman at the well, who by society was seen as a throwaway. O oh God, we praise you that you saved us for your glory. 
And so may we glorify you in our lives and may we glorify you in our worship. And may we lead others to the same. For we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.